Good morning, my church. Hey, we're just here this morning. We're, we're getting ready to worship in awe and wonder our King of Kings and our Lord of Lords. So wherever you are in uh, the many hundreds of uh, home churches in our area and around the world, I hope you'll stand with us. I hope you'll sing with us. And I hope you'll uh, just pour out your heart and worship to our King. Let's sing together. church when they were very first beginning to celebrate that Jesus the Messiah had been resurrected and in them they had eternal life and hope and healing and wholeness and the promise of a great future and in those days as they were meeting they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer and so Lord that's what we do today we devote ourselves to you and your word we devote ourselves to being together and to sharing meals with one another. And above all, God, we devote ourselves to prayer. 
We long to see you shining, lifted high, and a great light upon our land. And God, it happens through your people. And so we put ourselves in our hearts, on our faces before you, and we pray, Lord God, that you would fill us with yourself. Use this hour to allow us to be more like you, King Jesus, so that you would indeed reign victorious over our city, our land, wherever your church is gathered and scattered. Amen and amen. Church, if you want to know how you can be a part of Eugene First, not only on Sunday morning, but throughout the week, then you definitely want to be receiving the Faith Family Flyer. That comes on Fridays. If you're not getting it, email simple office at eugenefirst.org. And you can follow us on social media, on Facebook and Instagram to keep up with all the things that are happening throughout the week, all the ways to connect with the church and with one another. Last week, we celebrated something. We celebrated that as a faith family, you had given $5,000 to Malawi to help provide food for pastors, families, churches, people who are very food insecure. Well, this week we want to further celebrate that your generosity poured out and we've sent $7,000 with a special shout out to the Hispanic ministry who participated and sacrificed greatly to serve our brothers and sisters on the other side of the ocean. So just praise God and hallelujah for that. We thank God that that partnership continues. Now this morning, we're going to take a moment and receive tithes and offerings through the Give app or through eugenefirst.org. In the menu, click Give, and that's how we do giving now in the way that church is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, there is nothing that can stop the work of your kingdom from going forward. No virus, no meeting in homes. That's how you started the church, Lord. So we give you praise and glory that we can still be your people, we can still be fed by your word, and we can still give to the world the great hope that we have in Jesus. So Lord, would you bless our offering this morning and continue to multiply it the way you astound us week after week in all the things that you do. May we be known as people who are radically generous. In Jesus' name, amen.
this morning, God, is that your spirit would lead us, that your spirit would guide us, that, God, your spirit would have complete control of our lives. And to say it in the, in the words of the Apostle Paul, that we would not be drunk with wine, but that we would be controlled by the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we open our hearts, our lives, we open our bodies, everything we are. Lord, we come to the throne of grace and say, Jesus, lead us. Lead us to the places that you need to take us. Lead us to the people that either we need to give hope to or receive hope from. Lord, our lives are in your hands. And Lord, we love you this morning. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for how you're working and moving and how you're speaking. How you're still the head of the church. Now more than ever, <laughs> you're still the head. You still give the growth. You still cause the increase. And so we come to Jesus, the head of the church. And we say, shepherd us and pastor us today, Jesus. We can't do this without you. You're a good shepherd, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Well, God bless you guys. Thanks for uh, joining us this morning. Um, as we get going, I do want to say just a couple of things. Uh, it is Memorial Day weekend, which means something more than a three-day weekend. Uh, it's a time to uh, pause and to remember 
those men and women who have given their lives for us, for our country, because they believe that we were, by God's grace, forming a more just society. And so we take a moment to remember, to pause, and to pray for those people, to thank God for the freedoms and the rights that we have, because there are many people around the world who would love to enjoy what we have to enjoy. And so let's take a moment of silence. You can pray during this time, but let's take a moment to reflect and to remember those men and women who gave their lives so that we could be here today. Father, thank you for the sacrifice. You said greater love has no one than this, that they lay down their lives for their friends. And so, Lord, we thank you for those who have laid down their lives uh, so that we could enjoy what we enjoy. So, Lord, we don't take it for granted, and we ask, God, for your presence to be with our country, to be with our leaders. Lord, we pray for our elected officials today, from presidents to his cabinet, for governors for mayors all over our land, God, pour out your spirit. God, give us a spirit of unity. Give us a spirit of renewal. Perhaps, oh God, give us a spirit of revival. Lead us, oh God, in a more just way, a more equitable society. And we'll be quick to give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Friends, if you have in any small way received a little bit of encouragement from either the worship this morning, from this series that we've been in, would you do me a favor this morning? And I need 20 people to share this video right now and put in the comments, I'm in the 20. So uh, if you have been encouraged and you think there is somebody on your news feed, somebody in your friend group who could use a little bit of encouragement and hope this morning, share the video right now. Put in the comments, I'm in the 20 who shared it. And uh, I don't know, I wish we had a, uh, a treat to give the first 20 people, but the treat is you're just sharing hope and encouragement. So do that now, and that would be fantastic. And as you're doing that, if you have not gotten your elements for communion ready yet, you're going to want to do that. And so you can uh, share the video, go get your communion elements, your juice, your cracker, your flatbread, uh, whatever it is you've got, um, get that ready. We will be receiving communion together at the end of the service. Man, we are in our third and final week of rhythms, prioritizing what matters most. And we started this whole thing uh, three weeks ago with this idea that perhaps just maybe, 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 we have been gifted with this time during COVID season, the, the Rona season, we've been gifted with this time to consider what really matters most and how are we prioritizing what matters most. And as uh, states and counties begin reopening and there's this uh, uh, return to some type of normalcy of life in the public sphere, what is it that we, uh, when we return to that, what is it that we, we know that we know that we don't want to take with us into the new season that was kind of a drag from the last season and what is it that we know that we know that we need more of and so we've just been asking the question um, in, in this series just kind of reevaluating our daily rhythms and 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 not just reevaluating them just for the sake of it but in light of the scriptures who place a call on our lives to be followers of Jesus to be disciples of Jesus, right? Nowhere in the scriptures does it ever call us to be churchgoers. Now, going to church might be part of being a disciple or follower, but nowhere does it say, I'm calling you to be a churchgoer or to go to a building. It says, I'm calling you to follow me, to be my 
disciple. And the word disciple meant a learner or a student. And we, we kind of discovered together that a disciple, a learner, or a student was someone who rearranged their lives, or you might say reprioritized their lives, to be with Jesus, to become like Jesus, and to do what Jesus did. Like that is what a first century disciple of any rabbi was going to do. They wanted to emulate both who their teacher was and what their teacher did. So when Jesus gave the call to be his disciples, that means something. It has meat to it. It means those who say yes to following Jesus. God, you are like those who recognize like Jesus, you're the Messiah. Like you are the source of life. You are the author of all good things. And, and you're inviting me to to participate in the life of God in relationship with you. And, and so for those who recognize and say yes to that, they, yes, I want to be a follower of Jesus, it means that you are going to rearrange your lives so that you can be with Jesus, so that you can become like Jesus, and so that you can do what Jesus did in this world and somebody on Facebook and YouTube and in houses and in kitchens and cars all over the state said, amen, amen, amen. Being a disciple means something. It means we are willing and not just willing, but we're actually living life differently than the world around us. We are prioritizing some things. We want to be with Jesus. Why would you not want to be with the author of life? We want to become like Jesus because he demonstrates what it means to be truly human, filled with the Spirit of God, responding to the life of God living in us and through us, loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving our neighbors as ourselves. Like he, he demonstrates what it means and, and, and to, to, to do what Jesus did, man. I mean, that's our life's highest goal. And, and maybe, maybe you're joining us this morning, and, and perhaps you are, and, and you've never even perhaps said that you want to follow Christ. And I want you to hear right at the beginning of this message, you've got a God who loves you, who is pursuing you, who has plans to give you a hope and a future, and all of that is found in a relationship with Jesus. And all you have to do is simply say yes to Jesus right now. But you don't have to earn it. You don't have to work for it. It doesn't matter your history, your background, what you've done. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. And all you got to do is say yes to Jesus. So maybe you would like to pray with me even before we jump into the message to say yes to Jesus. If you're joining us this morning, those who are joining us this morning and never said yes to Christ, let's just take a moment and pause and to receive the love and the life of Jesus into our lives. Father, you can pray this with me if you'd like. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for sending your son as a gift of life, as a sacrifice. I receive, I confess, and I say yes to Jesus today. Father, I need your love. I need your forgiveness. And I need your grace in Jesus' name. Friends, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, maybe you would just like to take a bold act of step, a bold act of step, a, a step of boldness, and, uh, and share that with somebody. Share it with somebody that's uh, sitting with you right now. Share it in the comments. But um, if you prayed that prayer to say yes to Jesus, I want to say welcome to the family of God. Being a child of God and a follower of Christ, there's no higher calling and there's no greater fulfillment because that's where true life is found. So welcome to the family, friend. So in this series, though, in this series, we've been asking these questions about uh, what matters most and reprioritizing that and, and, and doing it in light of the scriptures. And, and, and like I said, the scriptures call on our lives and just thinking, God, um, this, this beautiful season you've given us to reevaluate. Uh, we don't want to waste it. We want to lean into it so that when we go out of post-drona and back into the opening up of public life, 
God, we don't want to be scattered and hurried and busy and going from thing to thing. We want to give our lives to prioritizing and doing and being and becoming like Jesus. And so I promised you for three weeks, you're going to have a practical tool in your hand. And I'm holding true to the promise. It's happening. You will have a practical tool kind of in your hand. I mean, it'll be like a digital uh, 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 paper that, uh, digital paper. It'll be a digital thing that, a document that you have to print. But it will be there a little bit later. Not yet. It'll be there, though. We're going to be awesome. It's going to be great. Um, last week, we were, we were talking about uh, this idea of, of gardening. And I don't know if you've ever started a garden before. Uh, but for those who have gardened in the past, you, you might remember, I mean, we do, I just started this year, um, but those of the garden for a while, you, you might have to think back to this. Um, gardening can feel overwhelming in the beginning. When you look at a plot of grass and all you see there is dirt and grass, um, it feels a bit overwhelming to think of all the work and the labor and the planning that has to go into making that garden go from the ground, getting up to the air, and getting some plants and some veggies and some fruits growing. And one of the biggest time investments and one of the biggest labor investments is at the beginning of the gardening process. Um, for us, I... I um, I guess I don't really do things small at the beginning. I just kind of jump all in and kind of bite off more than I can chew. And so we've never gardened before in our entire lives. Uh, I mean, I tried it once, but everything died because we went on vacation. It was a terrible, terrible experience. And so this time we thought, you know, why not just get a 36 by 34 foot garden and just go at it? And so we did, we did it. We, we just went at it. And I'm telling you, dude, there was a lot of labor that went into that stuff. I mean, a labor of love because there's all sorts of things you've got to do. I mean, you got to put a fence up, right? I mean, there, you got to keep the animals out. You got to put like a chicken wire around the bottom of the fence because the fence's not even, and you got to keep the rabbits out. And you've got to build your raised garden bed. You got to bring in the dirt. Yeah, there's just so much stuff you got to do. Not to mention, you got to do the planting and the watering. And I mean, there's a whole planning for it. And then you got to what's going to go here, what's going to go there, and here, and how's it all mixed together, and you know what pollinates what, and they, is it. There's so much, so much. But like any gardener, um, you got to stop and ask the question, what, <laughs> what motivates a gardener to put all of that labor of love into something like that? What is it that motivates them? Because if you were just to stop and look at what you have at the beginning of the gardening process, it's pretty um, deflating. There's not much to it. It's, it's, you've got a fence and you've got some dirt on the ground. That's about it. And so you ask the question, what is it that motivates the gardener to do what they do and to invest that kind of labor of love and, and that planning and those practices and, and making sure the water cycles right and making sure the soil condition is What is it that motivates the gardener to do what they do and to invest that kind of a love and labor into the process. And man, you know what it is. At least I know what it is for me. I cannot wait until, I don't know, in a couple months from now, when I walk out into my garden at about 1130 in the morning, 11 o'clock, that sun's been sitting on those ripe, red, juicy tomatoes, and I'm going to reach down. I'm going to smell the tomato plant. I'm going to pluck that little puppy off, and I'm going to bite into that red, juicy tomato, and that stuff's going to fall all down my mouth. It's going to be good, man. That's going to be so, that's what motivates me to shovel all 11 and a half yards of that soil to get it where it needed to go, right? You, you want me to tell you what motivates me to do it? What, it, it, it? I know that I'm going to have a grill with some steak on it, and I'm going to have my, that, I got some rows of corn. I'm going to get one of those corn. I'm going to put it on the grill. I'm going to grill that corn, and I'm going to take that, and I'm going to eat it. It's going to be so sweet. It's going to pop in my mouth. It's going to be good, man. 
You want me to tell you what motive? I, I'm not, I got one more. You want me to tell you what motivates me to keep doing what I'm doing, to plan and to do and to practice the watering? And I do this because we got sprinklers. I don't know. That's kind of interesting. Isn't it? That's what the sprinklers do. Um, we're, we're spring, and what motivates us to plan out the garden and to get and to drill all the things and to make sure and, to, and to, what motivates us for that? I'll tell you what motivates. I got a strawberry plant. I got like three of them. And you know what happens in the afternoon after the sun's been beating down on that strawberry plant? plant all day you go up to that red juicy ripe one and if you've ever picked strawberries you know what sound I'm about to say it goes you know what I'm talking about you pop that you you pop that thing off you put it in your mouth oh my goodness the sweetness of that strawberry I'll tell you what motivates a gardener they've got a vision of what can be and they're not satisfied with what currently is a gardener has a vision of what will be and that's what motivates them to plan and to practice and to do what has to be done now. Even when the results aren't immediate, they stick to it because they know the corn's coming. Oh, boy. They know the tomato's coming. They know that that sweet strawberry's on its way. If I but care for the conditions that I'm responsible for, I know that I know the growth is going to keep happening. And that's what we were trying to say last week. That's what discipleship is all about. That's what transformation in Christ is all about, right? There are, there are practices and activities that we are responsible for. Transformation in Jesus doesn't have to be spontaneous. Check this out. If no one would call a gardener a gardener, if all they did was took some seeds and threw them out onto their lawn, that's not gardening. That's just lazily like throwing seeds somewhere. You're not a gardener. A gardener is someone who, pra who plans and practices these activities so that the fruit can be yielded. And that's what it is to be a disciple. A disciple is not someone who just kind of shows up to church every now and again. A disciple is someone who plans and practices spiritual disciplines so that they can be with their master Jesus, so that they can become like their master Jesus, so that they can do what their master Jesus does. That's what it means to be a disciple. And catch this. They're not satisfied with what currently is in this moment. They are motivated to do the practices of spiritual disciplines for what's coming and what can be because they know that God is transforming them into the likeness of Jesus Christ. They've got a vision of what life is going to be like as they say yes to Jesus for five months, five years, ten years, Ten years down the road, they know they're going to be a more whole, mature, emotionally mature, spiritually mature, walking in wisdom person than what they are right now. And that's what motivates them to do what they're doing in the, in the current time. And, uh, you know, I, I was thinking about that as, as we're talking about rhythms in, in, in Jesus. I think, I, I actually think Jesus himself he had practices and rhythms that he practiced. Check, check out Luke chapter 4, verse 16. It says this, He, Jesus, went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And, uh, and it was on the Sabbath day. He went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. And then the passage goes on about how he reads from Isaiah and, and the people kind of get upset. And, and we just go right past verse 16 and we get into the other part of the story. But what I think is interesting is uh, that little phrase, as was his custom. That word in the Greek can also be translated habit or a practice that you do over and over. What I, what, what I think the, the Luke was trying to tell the readers is that Jesus had a habit and a practice of gathering with a community of people to talk about the scriptures together. It wasn't just a once-off. It was actually a habit that Jesus had in his life. It was a practice that Jesus practiced to gather with a community of people and to learn from the scriptures together. In Luke chapter 5, verse 16, it says this, But Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. The word often actually isn't, isn't in the Greek text, but it comes from the verb withdrew, which is a present tense verb. And all the grammar people online are like, yes, baby, he's talking about grammar again, finally. Um, the, 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 the word withdrew is in the present tense, which means it was continually happening. Like it was a lifestyle that Jesus lived. 
It wasn't just, well, I need to retreat once a year. No, this was something that Jesus often did. So therefore, the translators pulled that, that uh, idea of the present tense verb and just set it in the, in the translation. But Jesus often withdrew in the wilderness to pray. That was a practice. That was a habit that Jesus had. It just keeps going. Luke chapter 6, verse 12. One of those days, Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. Because it was his habit to, to pray, and, and in fact, you know, he, he, he says to the mountain, but the verse before it says that he went to the wilderness to pray in Luke chapter 5. So we know that Jesus practiced silence and solitude because he would... Uh, he would withdraw, go away from others. He would go out into secluded places. So he practiced solitude, silence, prayer, that this was a practice that he did. It was a habit that he had. And one more, Luke chapter 9, verse 18. Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked him, who do the crowd say that I am? And then again, this verse is just like the other ones. We usually skip over that part as like, well, that's just informational. And then we go right down to the story. But I think Luke was trying to give us insight into the life of Jesus. It was a habit. It was a practice that Jesus had to pray in private. Not in front of the camera. Not in front of people. But he had a habitual practice of silence, solitude, prayer, gathering with a community, reading the scriptures together, and learning together. I, I'm trying to say Jesus had a plan, and Jesus practiced his plan to be with the Father, to become like the Father, and to do what the Father did. He says that really clear in John chapter 5. He says, I as the Son, I can't do anything all I do is what the Father does. For whatever the Father does, the Son does in like manner. Jesus, though, Jesus had a plan. It, he had a habit. He had a practice. He had a plan, and he practiced his plan to both be with the Father, become like the Father, and to do what the Father did. So here's my question. Here's my thought is this. If Jesus had a plan, and Jesus practiced his plan... Don't you think that as followers of Jesus, we should have a plan and we should practice our plan to be with Jesus, to become like Jesus, and to do what Jesus did? If, the, if our rabbi, like if our master, I'm talking about like Savior Jesus, I'm talking about like the real deal Jesus, the one who walked on earth, the Messiah, the coming one, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, if that Jesus had a plan of practicing spiritual disciplines, which we know is, at least in these passages, which was gathering with the community, reading the scriptures, silence, solitude, and prayer. If Jesus had a plan and he practiced that plan to be with the Father, become like the Father, and do what the Father did, and we're followers of Jesus, shouldn't you and I have a plan to be with Jesus, to become like Jesus, and to do what Jesus did? And so I want to ask you this morning, what is your plan? What is your plan? And are you practicing it? Now, I, that's not a condemning question. It's just a uh, probing question. What is your plan, and are you practicing it? If you can't answer that question in like two or three succinct sentences, then chances are you don't have a plan. And listen, you're in good company because the majority of Christians or followers of Christ, the majority of them don't have a plan. And so that was the whole purpose of our series is to help us, help one another to have a plan. That's what this whole idea of rhythms is, is let's develop a plan together so that together we can go into this new season practicing the spiritual disciplines so that our lives are continually transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, now, I promised it for three weeks, and here it comes. Um, the online hosts are going to drop a link into the comments. It is going to be uh, what I'm calling our trellis 
of transformation. This is also on the resource pages uh, page at eugenefirst.org. So if you don't see it in the comments immediately, you can go to eugenefirst.org, go to resources. It's there as well. And I believe it's going to be coming up on the screen. Uh, this is the first part of the trellis uh, of transformation. Now, uh, let me just read this first uh, paragraph there. In the same way, a vine needs a trellis to lift it off the ground so it can bear the maximum amount of fruit and keep free from predators and diseases. We need a trellis, uh, we need a trellis as a kind of support to organize our lives around abiding in the vine as Jesus imagined. So Jesus is the vine, and in John chapter 15, he says, he's the vine, we're the branches, we are to abide in him, which is that whole concept of being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and doing what Jesus did. So uh, having a trellis of transformation, a structure that we can build our lives around, a plan that we can practice. Uh, go ahead and hit that next slide. Um, I included on the trellis of transformation a succinct uh, explanation of the spiritual disciplines that we looked at last week. So this is uh, just a, a few of them. And, and guys, listen, for real, this is like we're barely scratching the surface. And this trellis of transformation plan that we're going to be looking at, that we are looking at, is barely scratching the surface. If you do some of your own reading and research and you look into this concept, uh, you might have heard it before as a rule of life or a trellis of transformation or practicing spiritual disciplines. There is a whole uh, slew of information out there that you can go as deep as you want to go. I'm just trying to get us off the ground and get us started. So um, if you go to the next slide, um, and for those that have the trellis of transformation up on your screen, uh, go ahead and take a look here. And let me explain what this is. So this is a small graph uh, with three goals on it. Um, as followers of Jesus, I want us to develop a, a plan a plan that we are practicing spiritual disciplines for these three reasons, to become like Jesus, to be with Jesus, and to do what Jesus did. And I want us to start by just thinking about our days and our weeks. So what can we do daily? So again, remember, this is all about prioritizing what matters most. And as a follower of Christ, what matters most is being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and doing what Jesus did. How are we practicing that? What are the activities that we are doing to help us be with, become like, and do what Jesus did? I want us to think about it in terms of the spiritual disciplines and what spiritual disciplines can you do on a daily basis and a weekly basis, okay? So as you're thinking about putting together your personal trellis of transformation plan, which is simply saying on these days, at these times, I'm going to practice these spiritual disciplines. As you're thinking about it, look at those spiritual disciplines and consider which ones you are going to practice. I want to give a few guidelines for you as you fill this trellis of transformation plan out. Number one, I want you to start with why. I want you to answer the question, why am I practicing spiritual disciplines? Personally, not just because I'm talking about practicing spiritual disciplines to be with, become like, and do what Jesus did. Don't take that as your answer, but I want you to answer the question personally for you. Why am I practicing spiritual disciplines? Number two, keep this guideline in mind as you're filling this plan out. I want you to be realistic and not aspirational. So be realistic, not aspirational. Don't put on your plan, uh, I'm praying for three hours in the morning and two hours in the evening. Not realistic. It might be aspirational. You might want to do that at some day. But let's just be, real, let, let's just be realistic. And um, maybe it's like I'm, I'm praying for 15 minutes in the morning and 15 minutes in the evening. That's more realistic than three hours or two hours. Third guideline as you're filling this out. I want you to be specific, okay? So start with the why, be realistic, and be specific. I want you to put down the day and the time 
that you are going to practice a spiritual discipline and then identify which discipline that is. So for example, on Monday morning at 6.30, I'm going to read my Bible and, and, and pray for 30 minutes. On, and that's, I'm going to do that on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. I don't know why we don't do it on Friday, but I'm, not, I'm, I'm just trying to be realistic here, folks. You know what I mean? I don't want to overshoot. Just being realistic. And, and maybe just one day a week is where you start. If you're not doing it at all, be realistic. Then start one day a week. But be specific that you're going to say on Wednesday at 8 a.m., I'm going to practice silence and solitude and prayer. But be specific, put a time and put a day to it. Fourth thing is I want you to start small. Hear, hear this, small things consistently practiced over time yields big results. Start small because small things consistently practiced over time yields big results. So going back to the example just before, if you're not reading the scriptures, if you're not praying regularly, start small. Just say on Monday and Wednesday at 8.30, I'm going to set aside 30 minutes to read my Bible and to pray. And that's where I'm going to start. And I'm just going to keep doing that consistently. And as we consistently practice the spiritual disciplines, remember what I said last week? Those spiritual disciplines are just windows that we open that allow the grace of God to come in. So start with the why, be realistic, be specific, start small, make it personal. Make it personal. Don't try and duplicate what somebody else is doing. Do what you feel like is realistic for you. So make it personal to you. And the sixth thing that I want to encourage you to do is to share it publicly. So once you've filled out your trellis of transformation plan, I want you to share it publicly on social media. Hashtag it, my transformation plan. And why do I want you to do that? Because I want you to encourage other people towards transformation in Jesus. That there is hope in this world that we don't have to stay the same, but that we can be transformed into the likeness and the power of Jesus Christ. That there is hope, healing, and wholeness available for us right here, right now, in the presence of Jesus. So let's encourage people towards transformation in Christ. And the second thing it does is that it will encourage yourself towards accountability. So take out your trellis of transformation plan. Start with the why. Be realistic. Be specific. Start small. Make it personal and then share it publicly. And then let's encourage one another with our plans that we're going to practice these spiritual disciplines so that together as a faith family, we can be with, become like, and do what Jesus did. Man, what would Lane County and beyond look like if there were a group of believers who actually rearranged their lives? to practice the spiritual disciplines, who actually rearrange their lives to be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and to do what Jesus did. Don't you think we could raise the evangelistic temperature in this city? Don't you think that, that we could raise the level of love and unity in this place? Don't you think that the kingdom of God could come in a fresh way as the people of God are walking in the power and the presence of God? Why? Because they are consistently practicing spiritual disciplines. Oh, my faith, man. Give yourselves to that. Give yourselves to that. It's going to be awkward in the beginning, but keep practicing it. Keep going after it. Go on our resource pages at eugenefirst.org. There's a Bible reading plan that can help you get started. If you don't have a plan, that's where you'll find the trellis of transformation. Fill it out. Pray over it. Share it with, with, uh, with, with your friends and family. And let's encourage one another towards a transformed life in Jesus. It doesn't have to be spontaneous. We can go after Jesus on purpose and with intention. And if Jesus himself had a plan and he practiced his plan to be with the Father, then we as his followers should also have a plan and practice the plan to be with Jesus. So let's um, gather around the Lord's table together this morning and um, let's receive communion together. So grab your elements and Pastor Julie will lead us in that this morning. Thank you, Pastor Ryan. 
I so appreciate that wisdom and that permission to start small. As we would just take these tiny little steps, um, Eugene Peterson, the Bible translator who gave us the message, he said a long obedience in the same direction. So a small step that we might take and continue with it for a long, long time, what kind of a difference would that make in our lives? And then this idea about sharing it publicly, I thought, what would I do differently and why would I do it? I have a, a long history that I've shared with you many times of Bible reading and prayer in the morning and what a difference that's made in my life. But I've become aware recently that it would be a very good spiritual practice to focus my thoughts on the Lord Jesus at night, right before going to sleep. Maybe even as a way to guard my heart and mind. So if I were to share publicly right now, I would say that it is my commitment to focus on the Lord in the word and prayer right when I go to bed. And it doesn't have to be long. It's just to focus myself on him. That's what I would like to commit to today. As we prepare to receive the elements of the Lord's Supper, the juice that represents his blood, and the cracker, the wafer, the bread that, rec that represents his body, which was broken for us, I'm reminded again of those words about the early church in Acts and what they did, how they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. As they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread, within that reference is that they devoted themselves to remembering the Lord's Supper. They devoted themselves to remembering what Jesus had done for them and that in him they had their hope. In him they were experiencing the healing that comes from his name. And in him they were experiencing this different kind of wholeness, this different kind of community. As they lived together, as they formed worshiping communities in Jerusalem and beyond, those who were not yet followers of Jesus looked at them and noticed that by their love for one another, how they cared for each other, how they met together regularly, how they worshiped and how they prayed, that it was making them so radically different. It was as if they were light where there was no light. And what happened? Their numbers were added to daily. Was that about the numbers? Is this Jesus um, attendance call here saying, woohoo, there were more and more people in my church than your church? No, this is that their numbers were added to daily, meaning that more and more people were following Jesus. More and more people had hope. More and more people were finding that their lives were radically transformed as they became like Jesus by being with him. And then going out and doing what he did together in community. So that's what our Lord's Supper, our communion is about this morning that we would use this moment to be with him, asking his Holy Spirit to fill us so we can become like him and then go out and do what he did. So we take the elements today and we begin with the bread, which Jesus told the disciples was his body, broken for them. He gave thanks. We see him kind of holding it up to God the Father and saying, thank you, Lord, for all that you've given us. And we say thank you, Lord, for all that you've given us in Jesus our Christ. And we do this in remembrance of our Savior. And, that's, and that same night, Jesus took the cup and he said, this is my blood which is poured out for you. This is the new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, we've taken these elements. We've received them into our bodies, representing your body, which was broken, your blood, which was shed for us and for all who would believe Lord, we ask that by taking these elements into ourselves and opening ourselves to this means of grace, that you would indeed fill us with your Holy Spirit. 
that we would be more responsive to you than ever, that we would be transformed into your likeness, and that the fruit of our lives, what is planted in the garden of our hearts, the fruit of our lives, would bring glory to you, our Savior. The name above all names. We love you, Jesus. Amen and amen. And church, wherever you are today, in homes, maybe in your car, maybe out in your backyard enjoying the sun, in the city or in the country, we pray the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ may fill your home, your relationships, and above all your heart, that we would experience transformation and be more like him this week. Amen and amen. The Eugene First Office team is here to help you throughout the week. Our hours vary day by day, so give us a call or email office at eugenefirst.org and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Our website, eugenefirst.org, is a great place to find contact information for all of the pastors, learn more about upcoming events, or even access our online giving platform. If you prefer to give your tithes and offerings by writing a check, you can mail that directly to the church office. As a faith family, our goal right now is not to remain busy, but to remain connected. For that reason, we have multiple small groups meeting throughout the week through online platforms like Zoom. Be sure and email the church office at office at eugenefirst.org for an invitation to our Eugene First Kids Facebook group. Weekly, we're having lessons posted, free printables, and other ways for your kids to be connected and for you to feel supported. If you're a young person, I just want to throw out there that uh, you should follow us on social media. Our handle is Eugene First Youth, Facebook, Instagram, we're there. Check your email every Thursday for the Faith Family Flyer to read the latest on connecting via social media and Zoom groups. Not getting it? You know the address. Email us at office at eugenefirst.org and we'll see you soon.